Recording started. Welcome to the Tampa, IIBA Tampa Bay, Florida chapter. This is our study group. This is our 113th study group. We're holding this on March 28th, 2024. Today we have an interview with seven international panel business analysts, and I am so excited to introduce you to these folks. Uh, James is to join from Ireland, John from England, Carolina from po Poland, Renu is from Canada, Exara is from Sri Lanka, Nino is from the Philippines, and Andrea is from New Zealand. So uh, let me tell you who you joined today. Uh, our organization is an international organization, and even though we're called Tampa Bay, we have members from all over the world, and we adore that. The reason we have members from all over the world is we don't charge any money for anything we do. We are here to build you up. We're here to answer your questions, and we're here to support you. We have our study groups. You saw that we've had over 100. Most of those are on YouTube. You can see those here in meeting recordings on YouTube. Uh, we also have this uh, study group. We have this on Zoom, study group materials, including attendance sheets, and a variety of things that folks have created for their own practice and study. They've donated to us. We put that there in the Google Drive. We also have our LinkedIn groups and Meetup. Uh, we are a volunteer-run organization. Uh, Cliff there, you can see him in the Millennium Falcon. Yulia is our Vice President of Finance. Vivian, Uche, Alicia, and Esther are board members at large. My name is Thea Soren. I'm the Vice President of Career and Professional Development for the organization. It's my job to support you. If you need assistance, if you need user stories reviewed, if you need help with your resume, if you need whatever, that's my job. Reach out to me on LinkedIn. We need new board members. We have a good board right now. We have high hopes for some good things that we can do in the next year. We need your help. If you're interested in being on an IIBA board and you have, say, three hours a month to give, we can put you to work and make good for us all. Our study group advisors are Bob Churchill, Yulia, and Uche. They have all earned their CBAP certification. And because they are participating in this study group hour, you get an hour's worth of education credit with the IIBA. Thank you to you all. We like to celebrate our wins. Uh, this is a list of people that have reached out to say that this study group helped them. And we love that. As I said, that's our only reward. And so we wanna know if we helped you. And so we keep track of it. And you may recognize, I'm sorry, I have the wrong slide here. IBA certifications we are focused on are the top three, the ECBA, the CCBA, and the CBAP. These are certifications that are directly related to the BABOC, and those are the ones that we work on. Those three, those four below are ad advanced certifications that the IIBA offers. If you're interested in any of those, reach out to me. I'll be glad to help you find the links. So tonight we're going to talk to these folks, and I'm going to ask them to each introduce themselves if they have arrived. Uh, let's see, Carolina, it looks like you're the first one on the list. Let me advance to your, well, nope. Let's start with you, Renew, because you're in the next slide. So sorry. Uh, tell us who you are and what you're doing. And if you want to tell us about your website uh, or anything else, you can let us know that now. Well, uh, my name is Renu Jen Patial, and uh, I'm from, currently I'm in Canada. So I have huge work experience in India working for US clients basically. And now I am in Canada for since last uh, seven years. I have worked in a variety of industries. I have worked in capital markets, publishing, US healthcare, learning and development, e-commerce sites. And currently I'm in public services uh, with the Ministry of Education. We are, we're, you know, my main types of projects currently are the licensing projects. Um, licensing projects are the projects which uh, they are the solutions which provide an automatic process for clients to sign up and apply for program service or an event. You know, like uh, like if you if you want to open a child care center, then you how how do you do that? You apply for it and then manage your license renewals, fee submissions, and everything through that website. So. Uh, I have worked on a variety of licensing projects currently. 
And uh, for volunteer work, I have a lot of other things to do. I'm, I'm so sorry, I'm not able to find time for volunteering, but I do provide some guest lectures at one of my friends' consultancy organization. Uh, that's in Canada, that's in like in my city itself. So as a friendly gesture, I work with him. But uh, in, the, in the field of business analysis, I'm not doing a lot of volunteering work. Outside this, I, I do, um, have uh, associations with uh, healthcare and education, but not in the IIB specifically. Yeah. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Thank you, Renu. Okay, uh, John, doesn't look like John has joined us. Uh, Neil. Hi everyone, uh, good day to you. Uh, I'm Nino Lopez from the Philippines. So I've been in the IT industry for the past uh, 15 or 16 years. Yeah, and uh, I started my career as a software developer working on process automation projects for two years. Then I moved on as a quality assurance analyst uh, for five years. Then now I'm enjoying my role as a BA. I've been a business analyst for eight years now. And uh, just last year, I gained my professional certification TBAP, um, and and um, this chapter has has helped me a lot in um, in my review and my journey towards CBAP. So thank you for thank you to the team uh, for establishing this uh, um, um, knowledge sharing sessions. And um, this uh, I believe it's uh, not only me as the recipient of this um, um, benefit, but also uh, BAs from around the world. So thank you for that. And uh, currently, I'm the program manager for this uh, program manager for Business Analysis Center of Excellence in our company. So that means I'm the practice lead for business analysis. I've been with that company for ten years, and uh, I, I've rose from ranks as uh, I started as a QA, then I moved on to BA, then now I'm managing the the entire business analysis practice with I believe around a hundred BAs. And uh, the nature of our business is uh, IT consulting. So we deploy this uh, business analysts to our clients who are in the banking and financial service uh, sector. So that means most of our projects are financial related uh, solutions uh, catering to the needs of our client. So yeah, uh, that's that's my quick introduction. Thank okay. you, Taya. And you're also a chapter leader of the IBA in the Philippines. Yeah, I, I forgot to tell you, I, I'm <laughs> my um my volunteering work. I have two main volunteering work. So um for my spiritual growth, I volunteer as a lay minister in our local church, and for my professional growth, I volunteer as a chapter lead for IIB Philippines chapter as the VP for programs and events. Very yeah. good, very good. Thank you. Welcome. Okay, Exara. Hi everyone, I'm Exar Jain, and uh, I, I'm having like uh, nine to 10 years of experience in the business analysis field at the moment. And uh, I started uh, in a Norwegian debt collection uh, company. So uh, making no, uh, software for Norwegian debt collection uh, clients. And uh, from there, I went on to work in uh, some Google uh, affiliated companies and then some startups. And then I uh, worked in Allianz, uh, one of the uh, global insurance uh, insurance uh, companies. And uh, there I did the BA practice at Allianz. Uh, for four years, I was leading the BA practice and I was the first person in Sri Lanka to uh, do a, a design sprint, a Google style design sprint in a financial institute. In, uh, in the country. And uh, actually uh, in Allianz, we uh, first time in Sri Lanka, we uh, created uh, enterprise scale design thinking pra practices, design thinking practices in a uh, company. And uh, we made sure that uh, the full general portfolio run in design thinking uh, methodologies. And uh, uh, in my time as the uh, lead BA there, uh, we got some good recommendation from the industry as one of the best BA practices in the country. And uh, so it was, it had been uh, a really good experience there. And uh, uh, there I, I was mostly involved in creating co-insurance systems. And uh, one of the projects that came to me is the 
uh, the uh, the largest project in the history of Ali and Sri Lanka. So that's to uh, expand the full enterprise platforms and uh, decommission 35 uh, peripheral applications. So uh, I had worked on the enterprise full enterprise scale solutions in Alliance and uh, uh, going forward, uh, re, uh, re, re, revamping the core insurance systems and building new platforms from the beginning and uh, using product uh, plat uh, thinking and lean uh, practices and then uh, design thinking. And now I work in uh, a company called Virtusa uh, as a lead consultant. And uh, here uh, I work in the insurance domain, uh, which I carried from the uh, Allianz uh, uh, experiences I had there. And uh, also, apart from that, uh, I uh, I'm a me I'm mentoring uh, individuals, and uh, uh, I'm a uh, writer. So I write in my uh, person newsletter called the Classy Business Analyst, and uh, yeah, I enjoy that one. And apart from that, I volunteer in uh, the local IIBA chapter uh, as the VP of Education, and uh, yeah, that's the introduction about myself. Uh, he didn't say that he just hit the. 10,000 followers. So oh, yeah. he's doing good work. Okay. Thank you very much. Okay. Carolina. It's my turn. Uh, good evening. So my name is Carolina. I'm from Poland. Uh, I am an IT since 20 years or something. And what is quite I think nice. I started as a tester, yeah. so I have a quite huge uh, quality management background, which is really beneficial in the work of uh, uh, in the work uh, of a business analyst. What I am doing, I am providing different consultancy services, education. I'm running courses. Uh, I am helping uh, customers in providing business value. I am also uh, providing lectures at universities, and. I used to work in different domains. I started in banking, then insurances. Now I am providing services to, to really different customers, starting from smart houses, ending uh, on manufacturing. And I am involved in quite many voluntary works, uh, including certification, like ISTQB, like IREP certification. I am a member of uh, uh, executive board at IREP. What else? I wrote several books. Uh, I am running my website and I am providing some free education for people. I am a mentor for some pe people as well. And what else? I think it's enough <laughs> as a short introduction for me. That's quite impressive. Thank you so much. Thank you. Okay. It looks like James has not arrived yet. Let's go on. Andrea. You're on mute still. Here we go again. Um, kia ora koutou, ko Torelli aho. Hi everyone, I'm Andrea Torelli. I'm um, SAP Business Analytics. I, I'm living in Wellington, New Zealand. I'm, I'm originally from Argentina, from Buenos Aires, but been living in this amazing country for 15 years now. Um, so yes, what I do, I work in the public sector. I work for the Department of Conservation. I've been working for them for the last 12 years. Um, most of the projects and the work that I do is implementing software or processes or systems um, or policy and um, making it operational within the organization. Um, in New Zealand, we're a small country. Our organization, our department is quite small. It's 3,000 people, but we do cover one third, management of one third of the New Zealand total land so and waters. So it's a big part of um, <laughs> land and waters that we manage and uh, contribute to make uh, sure that our um, fauna and flora is um, maintained and also our um, heritage um, buildings that we have around um, that they are preserved and they are available for the public. Um, New Zealand is a beautiful country. It's on the other side of the world. <laughs> um, Wellington being its capital is full of public servants. So um, that's a little bit of what you get the most when you're in Wellington. Um, being a public servant is always challenging because it means that the organization is in constant change. Every three years we have a new government 
and they decide what are the priorities. So priorities change quite a lot. And in the middle of that, you're also trying to implement all of these changes of software systems or um, processes, um, which is quite challenging as well. Um, so yeah, I don't have such a, an impressive resume like my other colleagues here, um, but I um, I really think I my my biggest focus is on people and how to change minds and hearts onto the new solutions that we are providing for the organization. Um, so yeah, I think that's a good brief summary about myself. That's a excellent summary. Thank you all. Okay, let's go through these questions. Let's see, most of you have already told us your name and country. Uh, if Let's skip number one because you all covered it. Let's go to what is the most challenging aspect of your job? Uh, Exara, you wanna start with that one? Yeah, sure, Tia. So uh, when it comes to my job, uh, from my past experiences, most of the time, the most challenging thing I had seen is that for me, uh, when I was trying to do new things, like uh, when, let's say, a BA practice or something like that, out of uh, the BA book, or let's say, uh, out of uh, any other design thinking practice uh, out there, human-centered design or uh, what's being done in IBM, it's kind of like very difficult to get the mindset of people to, okay, there's something new out there. We can, we can try this out. This will actually work and to get them on board with that and to get them vibe with that. So that's a little bit difficult thing that I had seen because even though we get the support of the sponsor sometimes and the support of the CIO, let's say the high levels of the company, there are other people also who will still uh, living in their shells and uh, not like to go out and see the sun, sun shine. So it's really difficult to get everyone out and make them uh, actually show them, okay, this is the environment, this is the sun, this is how uh, things outside uh, this place that you are uh, always looking at and uh, uh, thinking about. So that's the most challenging part. Even though you get the trust of few people, most mm -hmm. important people are the ones which supports you or who surround you. So it's a that means any practice, any BA work, anything, it's a work combination of all the stakeholders. It's not just the sponsor or the CIO. So we need to get the trust of everyone. We need to win the hearts of everyone and everyone should like what we are doing. Then only this will be a success. So getting everyone's uh, into one uh, place, it's a little bit uh, challenging thing when it comes to different, different age groups and different, different mindsets people are having. And with their backgrounds, they also like to uh, live in their uh, backgrounds and their, uh, let's say, uh, uh, technical uh, capabilities. So that's a uh, very challenging thing I had found in my career. I agree with you. Very good. Uh, Carolina, how do you, what do you think is your biggest challenges? Mm, several ones, and I'm completely with you, Ascara. I think that, well, the, the first challenge that I, I have a feeling that is appearing all the time in different projects and organizations is stakeholder, uh, stakeholder engagement. And to be honest, not existing engagement, <laughs> which is quite sad. Yeah, we, we, we are there to, to help to introduce change, and we are struggling with engaging stakeholders, which is this distraction of the whole story from the very beginning so that's one thing the second thing again sorry mm -hmm. to say but lack of re reflection we are focusing on delivering solution without understanding the real problem and from the business analysis competency perspective this is totally no go yeah that's another challenge that i am um, seeing all the time another thing and that is something that is uh, really not nice from the organization point of view. Uh, we are struggling with performing the impact analysis. We are changing one thing, destroying the other things. Yeah. So uh, these are the things that I can see uh, as a, I would say, the most challenging aspect of business analysis in different organizations, not in the current job. And I think that many of these challenging uh, challenges are the result of not seeing the big picture and not considering the organization as a system, but connecting things that are, let's say, interacting in a given environment. So that's my point of view. I agree with you. 
Bob says an ounce of analysis is worth a pound of debugging or worse. Okay, Renu, what do you think your biggest challenges are? I think um, what Escara mentioned and Carolina mentioned there, that those are my pain points too, the, because lack of engagement and lack of seeing a bigger picture is that what we, what we usually face. Since I'm into government organization and there are lots of manual processes that are being done here. So whenever we talk about digitization and tell them the benefits of digitization, the biggest fear that they have is that they're gonna lose their jobs. They don't want to move from manual processes to automated processes, though there's no danger to their job. They think their transparency would be lost, like their work would be taken over by somebody else. Mm -hmm. So the, that's the biggest challenge, convincing them of the benefits of the, the digitization brings, how it's going to improve the system, what benefits we bring in on the table with data collection, centralized data collection and data analysis. And then if you're dealing with a larger group of stakeholders, then getting a consensus is very difficult. A lot of time they, they usually have conflicting viewpoints, their priorities are conflicting, and, and, and a lot of times there are lack of processes, consistent processes in the system. And uh, when we have to digitize, when we have to create a solution, then we have to have consistent processes. They don't agree on one process, so we have to do a comparative analysis of different processes that are being followed and come out with the best one. And, and, and as I mentioned, since they oppose the change of digitization, a lot of times they don't come up with the, you know, they don't show their engagement. They don't respond back. They don't, uh, they don't give you enough information. They are not available. So getting them engaged is a big task. But thankfully, we have been able to get this done. We have delivered many solutions province-wide, which have been working and well received by the public as well. There are many public-facing uh, applications, as well as some of them are ministry-facing. So getting all the stakeholders on the same page, getting their consensus is a big, big task. So. I agree. It sounds as though we're all in the same country. It has nothing to do with where we live. It's it's we're working with people, right? Yeah. Okay, Nino, what is what is your biggest challenge? Yeah, actually, I was about to say the same thing. So whether you're starting off as a new BA or someone who is in, who is tenured in business analysis, it's always managing stakeholders who will be will pose as one of the not really the biggest challenges, but one of the main challenges because primarily BAs are working with uh, different uh, people from different walks of life, right? So they have a uh, different mindset. They, 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 they don't like, you know, it's really uh, the diverse stakeholder interests. Uh, that's one of the challenges so far that uh, I've been uh, dealing with uh, for the past uh, 10 years as a business analyst. Because uh, as a BA, I have to interact with a uh, wide range of stakeholders, uh, and that includes uh, business owners, project managers, developers, and even uh, executives. And uh, when, I'm, when I'm new to my role as a program manager and a practice lead for business analysis, so the first thing that I did is to do a cascade, and that cascade uh, includes uh, how to guide on managing stakeholders. Yeah. So that's the very first order of the day when I assume my role as a program manager to to uh, share them the how the, 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 the how to manage the stakeholders and map out stakeholders properly. Yeah. Very good. Very good. Okay, I think that we have four people of the seven here from the panel. Did I miss anybody? Me? <laughs> oh, oh yes, there you are. I'm sorry. <laughs> Andrea, please. That's so good. Um, cool. So um, I'm, I'm going to change it a little bit. I do agree with a lot of things that people have been saying, and I, I will reinforce some of the things like not the most challenging part of my job, but like the, the environment that you live on when you're working for the public sector is quite different from working from the public public sector here in New Zealand. Um, it's always like what I was mentioning before, every three years, government changes. And if you change from a national government for, to a labor government, they actually change quite a lot what they want to spend their money in and um, where the budget will go and conservation sometimes 
ranks, ranks lower for national than for labor. Um, so there's always in the public sector that sense of scare resources like that you don't really have the money to achieve what you want to do. Or if you're going all out with a project, you also are seem like you're spending a lot of money. So it's kind of like frown off. So you don't really, so it's always like a poor culture, like where you don't want to, you want to spend just enough because it's um, taxpayers money. Um, there's also really um, a, in the environment, what happens is, is always on a look for the public sector, the public people, uh, the public itself to, um, to, to judge what you're doing. So what we have to do, what we encounter in, in our job is a lot of official inquiry acts. So in New Zealand, we have this law that is um, any of the departments can be asked to answer a question to the public. So the public, any, any, any person of the public can ask a question about how we use our resources and we need to um, offer a reply to that person in 30 days, I think it is. So we have to, sometimes you're working on something and you have to stop everything and just answer that question from the from the member of the public to say, why did we use the resources in one way or the other? Why a decision was made? Um, so the Department of Conservation, what I didn't describe before, we um, write policy, we write, um, we also are, have the park rangers out there, but we do quite a, do a lot of different things. Um, we look at conservating um, historic uh, artifacts and assets that we have. So all of those things, we can be judged by the public sector and say, why are you doing it one way or the other? So that's just to give an example about the environment a little bit. And I'll let Reno, uh, you have a hand up. Yeah, if you want to add something. Yeah, so I think public sector is um, uh, similar in most of the countries because whatever the uh, government spends money on, there's a right of information the public has. Whatever is government doing, public can ask, public has right of information and they can object to anything. They can ask for information why something is taken up and how the money has been spent. But I uh, just want you to understand, like, uh, like in our place, we have, we don't directly interact with public, like if there are any questions, objections or anything, like we have spokesperson from our ministries, different ministries who actually handle those questions and every communication that goes out of ministry with the public. So I'm sure, uh, is it the same or is it different in your area? It's, it's similar, but like, there will be the, the groups of people that are closer to the topic that the question is, because questions can be super specific, like why the Maui Delphin um, protection area is being reduced from 2,000 kilometers to 3,000, you know, like it could be anything really specific and really small too. And so people from in, inside the department have to stop answer that question and then it goes to um to the spokesperson that will actually sh share that information but we we do have that time frame that i'm pretty sure that is 30 days i haven't done many yeah. myself and so you have uh, that quick turnaround that you have to give this information and stop whatever you're doing and provide yeah, that information to the public so it's quite interesting yeah i agree um, then you have to stop work and just provide the information yeah. get the details and just Feed, feed the spokesperson, yeah, I, I get yeah. it, yeah. Um, a, another part of understanding what um, is different from New Zealand, I think it's, um, that is some people don't know as much is that we are bi bicultural country. We actually have the, what it's called the Pakiha. And as you can hear my introduction, I actually use a little bit of Te Reo Māori, which is the language from from New Zealand um, and uh, or Aboriginal people you would call it or Indigenous people, um, the Maori people are the people that were in the land. And what happened was when the British came, um, like any colony, they tried to get them to submit to their order, and they got a really fight back from the Maori people. And so this thing that is called the Treaty of Waitangi, I'm simplifying this a lot, so, uh, but you can go and research a little bit if you want, um, was established where um, it was agreed by the Crown and the Maori people that um, the Maori was still gonna be the owners of the land, but that the 
the the the, the British could come and leave, and and this a, 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 a long set of agreements, a treaty a treaty agreements that have been written, and this in 80, 80s, 80s, like eighty seventy. 870s um and that's very different from other countries because it really dictates that sometimes we have legislation that it says about protection of the lands because it's for about um maori people um we have um yeah so it's it's very it's very different um it's slowly getting more introduced introduced into the way of working and especially in government you have to be quite um good with the protocols of how to deal with that. So that's quite different in our environment, how we work. Um, and um, they have some really lovely values, I think the Maori people, and especially when it comes to um, their land and the waters, um, really respective of them and trying to protect them is, is really their key thing. So that's a little bit of the difference. I think that we can, I can, describe about what is living here in New Zealand and what it was for me also coming being a foreigner and coming and learning from the um, different culture uh, our country we're living with two cultures at the same time and trying to um, when you work being um, a good treaty partner because that's what we need to be as part of the government as well as everything else and we need to um, uphold to that treaty settlement that we have that it has been written that while ago so we do a lot of work that is looking towards um, agreements that have been done into that treaty that now have become legis legislation. Anyway. It sounds as though you have some stakeholders that we would never have just because yes. of the regulations that you have. And so yes. the processes you must follow. Yeah, so I, I, I haven't do, done a lot of um, iwi, it's called a group of Maori people, usually from an area. I haven't done um, a lot of uh, iwi elicitation, but like there's um, always, um, when there are things that are big and they're in, in, in Maori land, there's um, elicitation that you have to do. It's actually more than elicitation, it's just um, consultation with them and making sure that they agree with what you're going to be doing. Mm -hmm. And and you have to follow the protocols. You go to the marae, which is their the kind of village, and you have to sit down and share, break bread, you know, follow their traditions and stuff, mm -hmm. and um, really involve them in the stakeholder conversation. Um, so there's quite a bit of that that we do, which is quite different probably from other countries, that, I would say. I would agree with but, you. But then on what I found my most challenging from my job is pretty much what everybody else said. <laughs> and I think like I would um, reduce it to also influencing up to making the right decisions. It's really challenging for me. So trying to get the senior leadership to understand why a decision is right or wrong. Mm -hmm. And then influencing down as well is quite um, hard sometimes to make sure that you promote the, the the solutions that you are actually deciding that they are good for the business and saying let's use this new tool and a little bit like what um Eskar was saying about let's go and see the sun the sun is good <laughs> and trying to convince <laughs> right. people that um change is not that bad that's right very good okay um uh, Rina would you answer the next question first what is the most satisfying or rewarding part of your job being from Canada yes so, you know, I'm in public sector. So when I see the direct benefits of our applications, it really satisfies me. So like I mentioned, we are normally, most of my projects have been digital transformations, like converting the manual processes into the uh, digital solutions. So when we start working with the clients, when we start working with the stakeholders, a lot of, there are lots of disparities in what they want their lack of processes, there's no consistency. And as I mentioned, there are conflicting priorities. So the, the most satisfying part of my job is like when I see my solution being done, when it comes into existing and people are using it and they're getting the benefits out of it. And that, that really that really sounds good, especially when, when you see the workflows that you have designed, the screens that you have designed are being used by people and they are finding it easy to use. They are actually able to use them. Then you, you really feel good. And, and that's the, that makes all the efforts worthwhile, frankly speaking. 
I agree with you. Uh, Carolina, what do you think is the most rewarding and satisfying part of your job? Yeah, I would say similarly like uh, Reno, but for me also when you can notice that stakeholders, they are coming to the solution by themselves. Mm -hmm. So you are facilitating communication with them. You are helping them discover what they really need, how to do it. That's challenging because this way you can basically, you can improve people, not only processes, not only solutions, the functioning of the organization, but you can make people to some extent better in the job. Teaching them reflection, teaching them a kind of system analysis, yeah. And when you see that they really can find the solution, when they can really can define the problem and find the solution and and deliver the solution, for me that is the most satisfying part of my my job. When I see people growing. Yes, I I agree. That is very satisfying, isn't it? Nino, how, what is the most satisfying part of your job? Yeah, for my job, I can think of two things. Uh, first is building relationship. So, so BA, as what I mentioned earlier, we always work with uh, people from different walks of life and different industries. So uh, building and maintaining positive relationship uh, with stakeholders is one of the most satisfying um, um, uh, part of my job. So... One and another is uh, similar to the rest of uh, my co is that it's uh, the tangible impact, the solutions that you are now able to deliver. Because, uh, by definition, business analysts are in the practice of enabling change and facilitating uh, discussions around that change and provide value. Right? So, the, the end goal is always to provide value. So, uh, the, the most satisfying part of my job is when I see the tangible impact of the solution and it now provides value to the people that that is that that very good very good andrea how about you what's the most satisfying part of your job oh i think pretty much it's been said um helping people is the big one for me um just helping them and empowering them to work smart not work hard because yeah Pretty much, I, I help them with what the solutions that we provide are, are to help them to do the work. So I like it when when we can help them and when they can do the work better by themselves and mm -hmm. um, not being frustrating about um, using something or, you know, making things efficient, I think, for them. And I, I do agree with Cliff there. Or, yeah, I think it was Cliff or Rob that said... Um, the light bulb moment when you see the light bulb moment on people is just so satisfying it's just like worth you know three hours of somebody being a pain in the ass to just see one <laughs> light bulb moment <laughs> i agree um exara tell us the most exciting and satisfying part of your job then i'm going to introduce john but let's let i want you to answer first yeah, so uh, I agree with everyone. So everyone got a very valid point. And uh, from my perspective, for me, the most satisfying thing is like uh, the most cherished thing as a business analyst, what I do is trying out new things and failing and also succeeding. So it's like uh, picking up, uh, let's say, any technique from the BA book and trying out it uh, fresh without knowing anything going out yeah. there, risking everything. And uh, meanwhile, failing also, it uh, gives me that uh, reward. Like, uh, I, because I learned from that moment that, okay, this is uh, this is the way it can, it will fail. And I will know, okay, there's another way that, that if I do it in another way, I can succeed in this thing. So doing those things and uh, failing and succeeding, trying out new things and being the, let's say, being the Naruto or the Monkey D. Luffy of the project, and uh, being that uh, knucklehead in the project, so trying out things, so risking everything and uh, uh, not in a way that means not, not risking the project, but uh, like uh, trying out new things and uh, actually adventuring and uh, being a, actually getting the taste of being a BA. So that's what I cherish about uh, and that's the most satisfying and rewarding thing for me. Yeah. Okay, so I've heard, I've heard making people's lives better, 
uh, having them see and use the products that you use, doing the adventure and, and the risk and the relationships. Did I miss anything? I think that's the way it is around the world. I'm going to stop real quick and introduce you to John Weisner. John's joining us from England. It is late there. Welcome, John. Hey, Fia. Hey, everyone. Yeah, it is a bit, it is a bit late. Apologies. I've been a little bit more late myself. It's okay. You want to give us a brief intro? Yeah, so uh, my name's John Wisner. As you, as you mentioned already, I'm uh, based in England. Um, I work uh, for a financial services consultancy by the name of Capco. Um, I generally spend my time working on VA-related projects, transformation programs, leading business analysis teams. Um, I'm the BA and process capability lead at Capco, so uh, a lot of my time is spent as well developing our uh, community and our capability um, and advising clients on uh, on BA practice and, and how to uh, how to progress their projects and their initiatives. Well, John, and, given all that leadership and, and your podcasts, of course, uh, what is the most satisfying part of your job? Um, I think it actually comes with uh, like meeting new people, um, interacting with different stakeholders, um, and, and those people as well. They're not necessarily external people or new clients or stakeholders. Quite often they can be new members of the team junior BAs, um, and then, you know, as you see, that, particularly with, uh, with members of the team, as you see them develop and uh, and progress and uh, and be leading BA projects themselves, that's uh, pretty satisfying, in fairness. And, and it's, it's nice occasionally when uh, you might get a bit of a, a bit of a, a nod from them to say, you know, remember that uh, I might have had some involvement in their uh, progress at some stage. That's right. But yeah, That's definitely meeting people is, is excellent. This is one of the biggest benefits we get. I agree with you. Did I get everybody on the panel for that question? Okay. From the chat, uh, Bob notes Bill Moyers once observed that being a journalist is like having a license to be educated in public. The same is true for being a BA. I like that, Bob. Thank you. Okay. For our last question. Uh, what techniques or applications or processes do you feel that every BA should be aware? Uh, Exara, why don't we start with you? Uh, yeah, yeah. So there are two things I would uh, take into everyone's uh, notice. So first thing I uh, think is the requirement architecture. So it it goes. Uh, like we doesn't talk about requirements architecture and we doesn't give importance to requirement architecture when we uh, do our business analysis in normal day-to-day -day work. But when it comes to, when you're running a big BA practice, let's say if you're running an enterprise level solution, you will understand understanding these viewpoints, views and making them rich and that everyone will have a good understanding about the system and you have a good understanding and uh, clarity about the requirement. So that will help the business analyst work and the design and the solution to move forward. So I think there should be more uh, discussion should be happen regarding, uh, I, I had seen discussions happening with, regarding enterprise architecture, but uh, I think regarding requirement architecture also, let's say as an example, if you look at a tree from above, from the, let's say that's the viewpoint you are looking at, like the bird, bird eye view. You will only see the leaves, okay? But you won't see the stem. But if you uh, look at from another view, that means you will uh, stand on the ground and you will look at it from that angle, from that viewpoint, you will see the stem and another, uh, 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 another uh, actually a dimension to your requirement, your solution, your design. So you will you need to make those things actually uh, that architecture more uh, vibrant that everything is understood. In di through different viewpoints and understanding those viewpoints using the uh, the uh, defined models and uh, techniques and uh, getting that rich. So I think that conversation should be happened uh, regarding that part. And uh, the other thing I'm going to uh, uh, talk about is uh, when it comes to design thinking and understanding the end use is really important, thing, right? So we, we have like human-centered design, we create personas, empathy maps, and we use different different techniques to understand the end person, the end user, because it's very valuable. Uh, how they feel about your product, how they feel about your solution. So what I feel is that it's a transferable uh, skill. 
That means even though design thinking that understand the end person and the end user satisfaction, it's a transferable skill. It's what we call uh, the EQ, the uh, actually uh, uh, emotional uh, quotient. So that's the same transferable skill that a BA should have when they're collaborating with their stakeholders, with every stakeholder. Learn they are, what they are going, what's going through inside them. Look from their shoes. Learn their emotions, understand these people. Like you want, you're trying to understand using design, using different methodologies, trying to understand the people, uh, the customers and their uh, emotions. Same way you need to do the same skill and you need to understand your stakeholders. You need to understand your project manager, your business users, your uh, sponsors, everything. It's a transferable skill because every time I uh, highlight this every place I go, Design thinking is not a process or a methodology. Most of the people, they say that way, but it's not. It's a mindset. That mindset is that it's a skill. It's a mindset. That means you need to understand the emotions of the person standing in front of you. The person who's, let's say, a few uh, miles away from you and uh, using your system that you had designed. You need to have that emotional connection. You need to understand those people. So... Uh, I think that's the mindset that we need to grow as business analysts. That's the mindset that whatever we call it, design thinking, empathy maps, personas, whatever we create, we need to have that mindset to understand people. And I think those BS will are the ones who goes a long way, understanding people, understanding their clients, understanding uh, the people around them. And uh, that will make you a good BS. So those are the two things that I would like to highlight. Yeah. Very nice. I think... Go ahead. Yeah. Uh, I agree with Exara, totally agree with Exara. It's not the domain knowledge. It's not the, uh, you know, understanding of tools or techniques. Even if you don't know anything, if you understand the user, then you will find out the solutions on your own to come out with the requirements and bring out the best solution. So stepping into user's shoes is the most important thing that a business analyst should have. Whatever the work they are taking on, if they understand what the user's pain points are, if they you know, think from their perspective, what their needs are, what could be the complexities that they are facing, different types of personas, different types of roles. So I, I, I totally agree with Ascara that this is the soft skill that, that makes a BA stand out from all the other people if they can step into users' shoes and understand from their point of view. And and I, I see I think once you know that, then you should be able to tell user stories. You should be able to understand the user stories, create user stories, personas, so that you can actually deliver, uh, make this thing under, uh, explain these things to the rest of the team, to the development team especially. And, and when you are working on something which, which is very vague, when there are different viewpoints, then concept modeling is what you have to have in mind, getting a bigger picture of what you're going to design and what concept you're going to implement. That's very important. And, and, and prototyping is what you should be able to, once you understand what you want to deliver, then prototyping is what that comes in very handy. Once the users see what they are going to get, they get a better idea of what they need also. And they come up with more requirements. They, they are able to understand what the solution would be and how the solution would help them. They, they, they start getting to understand you better then. So some of these techniques I just mentioned are very important for a business analyst. And, and I think the most important tools that uh, that I have worked on for uh, worked on so far, Jira is a wonderful tool for all sorts of requirement work. You it can, helps you create release plans. It helps you create user stories. It helps you work on detailed requirements, backlog maintenance, everything. It does a lot of work for the uh, for a business analyst. And then if you are into prototyping, then I think Excel is a good tool that I personally like. And Excel is a universal tool. Everybody should be using it. So that's I agree. my team. Thank you. Thank you. Those are very good techniques to use. Who would like to go next? Yeah. Maybe I, the, if uh, I might. Sure, Marilyn, go ahead. Yeah, thank you. Because I, I would like to comment a little bit on what you just said. Exara uh, 
I'm with your requirements, architecture, and basically requirements in engineering. I think this is something like a must have for business analysts. And again, I have a feeling that this competency is sometimes uh, missing. In order to produce, to deliver a solution, you need to understand the, the stakeholder needs and so on. And you need to specify them in a precise way. And this is something that we are struggling with. So we need to learn how to elicit requirements, how to specify requirements, validate how to manage them. Yeah. So that is why I think requirements engineering uh, can help us. And um, what is also an important aspect on the whole story, we need to understand that requirements are coming not only from users, they are coming from different sources. So focusing on user stories and so on can lead you to the wrong direction. And that is why we need to understand the, the whole context of the organization on the system. Yeah, the system, the business system that we are talking about. Uh, so again, a kind of competency of looking at the problem from the big picture, understanding the, the organization as a system of interacting parts. This is a skill that I, I think will be real helpful. Knowing all, all as uh, Renu, as you said, knowing the, the business domain, this is something that you can uh, you can uh, you can learn. That is why you you have stakeholders. They mm -hmm. have the business knowledge. You have the toolbox. Easy. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And regarding Jira. Forgive me, no offense intended. I hate Jira. I hate it. <laughs> yeah. It's allowed. a completely <laughs> anti pattern of case tool. This is not an information management tool. It's perfect for ticketing, not for storing and managing the information. Yeah. If we are talking about managing the, the informational model, uh, let's go into a little bit more dedicated tools like, I don't know, enterprise architect or whatever. Yeah, a tool that will really help us to create a model, not a picture or not a text, but a model. So that's from my side. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, and also for what Carolina added, I need to add uh, regarding systems thinking, thinking as a system. So what I had seen is most of the time, BES, they uh, tend to zoom in. I think what we need to do is we need to zoom out also. They, we need to understand the, com that means the, uh, look, look at the bigger picture and then come come with the uh, analysis, the proper analysis. I think uh, that's one of the very important things uh, for a good BA to have a good uh, skill. I I agree. Okay, John, do you have anything to add? Um, yeah, I think uh, I think definitely agree with many of the points that were in fact practically all the points I think that were said be, before me. Um, I think I'd like to sort of like take things from a different direction i think and also specify the importance of some of the more fundamental skills of like uh just communication and listening and, and facilitation um i know xara i think mentioned about taking pers different perspectives as well which i think is really really useful and mm -hmm. uh just you know that coupled with that empathy and putting yourself in other people's shoes can, can definitely help um but quite often i think i see um I see people talking about communication and putting more of an emphasis on talking. And actually, I think as BAs, probably the more emphasis should be on listening um, and only talking really when we need to to get more information out or when the stakeholders have finished giving their, the information. Um, I think when we're doing that as well, I think there's a good opportunity, irrespective of what the scope is sometimes, to just listen to our stakeholders and see what else they're telling us around the, the picture. We may not necessarily be able to fix it straight away because of the scope of what we're working on. But if we can appreciate the bigger picture, what what issues they're having, what opportunities they're aware of, then perhaps we can um, we can do something about it at a later stage, if not if not sooner. So I think that uh, that is a quite a fundamental technique for me. I think I think business process is always a, a very useful technique to allow us to perhaps understand the context from the business and the stakeholders that we're working with. And to really maybe identify new perspectives or new stakeholders that we should interact with. So I think it's really important. Um, uh, I, I probably could go on. I won't, I'll deliberately try and avoid every uh, listing every technique, but I think there's definitely as well a benefit in BAs having modeling skills and functional design skills to try and think about a problem in a different way and to get it on paper in a way that the stakeholders can see the way you've interpreted the information. Mm -hmm. So that they can they can validate it or they can they can uh, tell you you're wrong, which is perfectly fine as well. You know, as soon as that's, we get it on paper or we verbalize what we know, um, 
then it's an opportunity for our stakeholders to correct us and then we will be right. You know, so I think any anything we can do to get information on the paper and out there quickly, then it's a good opportunity to be corrected quickly, I think. Very I think good. as far as tooling is concerned, I think I'd probably just add, um, you know, uh, yeah, I think I think there's, there's definitely the, the tool we've mentioned that are, are decent ones are like Enterprise Architects. I think that's, that's quite a good one. But for me, um, I'm quite a fan of just the simple tools, Visio, uh, um, uh, Excel, um, and, and even just using uh, like Mural or something like that, just to start communicating with stakeholders around what we know. Right. Very good. I'm loving that we're hearing things that we know. I mean, it, we were thinking y'all were going to be using tools that we have never heard of, but we're all using the same tools and that's exciting. Andrea, you have your hand up. Yes. Um, I wanted to follow up a little bit on Carolina's um, thing. Uh, I, well, th there's, there's a couple of things. So I do agree with a lot of things that have been say, said so far. So from, from the skills, I think that emotional intelligence and relationship management is really key for BAs. And in, in the matter of um, what Carolina was saying a little bit more was like, you really need to, um, as well as understanding the end user and when the user is coming from, you do need to understand the bigger picture and the context, understand really well the business to understand where they're going and what is it that they want to achieve before even thinking about the users and the process of the whatever solution you want to do. So what is it that you want to achieve as the first thing? And for that, I've seen tools like um, the Cardinal Business Process or looking at the business architecture. All of those type of things can help you understand the bigger picture. Because I've been in the organization for 12 years, I've seen... Uh, a whole bunch of, uh, you know, a whole parade of BAs coming into projects and asking the questions and stuff, but not really understanding the organization. So um, in my different roles that I've been in the organization, I was like always um, introduced to these people and like one of the stakeholders or one of the subject matters of, of the topic. And I was always starting from the beginning. This organization is about uh, Papa Tunuku thrives, you know, making our environment thrive. So that's what I talk about. And this is what we're trying to achieve. And our people are helping us achieve that. And um, just um, starting with the fundamentals is really important. And then you can layer up like with really good elicitation and listening and um, you know, user uh, cases, scenarios, user stories to understand what's happening to the people. And and sometimes it's interesting because people just come to find a solution and they're not really looking at the root problem, like what we were experiencing that um, past class uh, study group that they were telling about that um, driving in Texas, that kid, that, that accident and they were trying to put the speed bumps and it's like, well, do you not really identify the root problem of the of, of, of this? So I think that it's really, really important to hold the bigger picture context. Go deep down into the end user and um, communicate and, and, and test it over and over again with them if you're going into the right direction. Very good. Neo, what's your favorite part? I'm sorry, what is the technique or application or process that you think everyone should be aware? All right. So personally, I don't have a preferred technique because if you will look into Babo, there's at least 50 techniques that a business analyst can uh, utilize uh, as, as, as we do our work, right? But um, one important thing that I'm... I, I'm always telling myself is that I always work with my stakeholders and these stakeholders have their uh, requirements, right? So whether specified or not, they have a need or a problem that they want to address. So as, um, I, I've learned throughout the years that the most important skill that a business analyst should uh, be able to utilize is the requirements analysis and design definition. So I agree with Exara earlier when he mentioned that uh, one skill that we should need to look into is to properly categorize and um, understand and define the, the requirements architecture because that is where the big part or big chunk of the work of 
our work as PAs comes come into like come into play. Yeah, and um personally, uh, I think that business analysis is a balance between uh, science and art. Uh, there's not really a perfect uh, formula for you to be able to do your work, but you, you have to always think in mind that you are working with stakeholders and that they have their own needs and problems that they want to be at. Right. Very good. Um, I'm going to introduce James Dean, who's just joined us. Time zones are tricky, guys. I just want you to know, especially halfway around the world, in the middle of the night, folks committing to join us, they joined us, but, you know, time zones are tricky. But James, why don't you introduce yourself real quick, and then you can answer the last question. What techniques and applications or process do you feel every business analyst should be aware? Yeah, sure, no problem. Thanks so much, uh, Tia. Um, I'm so sorry, guys. I, I literally got the time zone mixed up. I thought it was at midnight, um, and I realized I joined and used around the last question. Um, <laughs> sorry about that. <laughs> okay. um, my name is James, James Dean. Um, I've been a business analyst for about seven years, and I've worked in different kind of industries. Um, so I started working in like corporate and business registries, then I moved to life sciences, and now I'm currently working in the energy industry. So I work um, in the product development departments within the within my current company called Grid Beyond. And I'm mainly working with the business to understand what they need to like implement, say, a new energy service or if we're looking to into like a new energy market. So guiding different team members or different kind of teams that I would work with or different people in the, the business to make sure that we understand like what is the problem or opportunity based on the, the business needs and who is impacted by that problem, what is impacted, so processes, system, people, uh, what goals are we trying to achieve. So a lot of my kind of role has been, because I've been the only BA when I started in the company, I'm there two years now, and um, it's been a lot of kind of educating senior leaders and kind of managements just to say what the BA role is and like how they kind of fit into these kind of different projects. So it's been a lot of like mentoring and coaching and leading and guiding. And because previously it was like, oh, we want a BA on a project. And they'd be like, I'd say, what do you want me to do? So I'd be trying to clarify my role. And they're like, oh, just get requirements. And that's very ambiguous for me. So I wanted to like break it down to get a better understanding, to understand what is it exactly that you want me to do, but how can I deliver value as well? Because we're all about uh, delivering value. Um, so I'm based in Dublin, in Ireland. Um, and then to, to answer the last question, uh, which I think is a great question. So techniques and applications um, or processes, do I feel um, business analysts should be aware? So active communication and collaboration, I think without those kind of key skills, it's very hard to work with different people because it's a people job that we're, we're working with. There's different people that we need to work with, different kind of business people, different technical people. And we need to have that mindset and the way of thinking to know how to communicate our requirements to the business people, but also how to then translate it so that technical people would understand. And that's a, a, a part of like kind of working with different people, collaboration. I think there's so many different tools or techniques within like the Baba guide, so the business analyst body of knowledge. I think some are really relevant, but I think to be kind of really successful as, as a BA, you need to have that kind of mindset to know when to apply a particular technique in a particular situation. Like if you're working, say, with the development team to understand like what are the kind of, how does the user need to interact with a solution? Or if you're building, say, a new product, like what are the different features? You might kind of look at use cases because they can relate to use cases. If you're working with a data science team or kind of a, a more kind of technical team to understand, okay, how do we capture the data or how do we structure the data? You might use entity relationship diagrams or data dictionaries or data flow diagrams or kind of different kind of tools there that would be related to them. So it depends on the situation or scenario that you're working in. Um, but I always find business process modeling is a great one. Uh, process analysis is also great because you're understanding what people do, what are the inputs, what are the outputs, what are different rules, who are those people, how do people use it today, and how does it actually flow, and what value, again, is that going to deliver? So I would say they're kind of the, the key things that I would say. Very good. 
Well, folks, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, seven countries heard from, including those of us in the United States. We are hearing the same things that we experience in our day to day. I want to tell you that whenever we were writing the Babak, and they only let us put in 50 techniques. And they told us we had to be prescriptive and not descriptive, which means we did a lousy job of putting in the techniques. But y'all are picking them up and that's what we need. Let's continue to learn from each other. And I really sincerely appreciate y'all joining us and giving us your insights so that we can know that we're all doing the same job. It's just different people in different places with different regulations. Thank you for joining. And this will be posted on LinkedIn. I'll post this in our chat. If you have anything to, to share with the group, send it to me and I'll share it out. Thank you, Thea. Thanks. Love Thank you, guys. Thank you, Thank you. Thanks, Thanks, guys. Good night. Good, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Bye. Bye.